Okay, great. Welcome, everybody. I'm so glad you could join us today. And we are here with our virtually visiting artist, Lisa Gordillo. And I will now turn off my camera, mute my mic, and allow her to introduce herself and talk about her work. So thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Lisa Gordillo. First off, thanks for coming. I'm really excited to get this opportunity to talk with you and present my work. Um, and um, it's just really nice to be here. I, um, so I am a sculptor and an installation artist. Uh, I've been doing that for a while now. I started, I always like to say how I started because I think it really informs my work. I started in theater as a set designer and a scenic artist. So. Um, so I think I still maintain a bit of an eye for the theatrical, but what it really manifests in my work is that I, um, I'm a storyteller. And I think that I just really connect with stories and I like to figure out um, what a story is asking of me um, and how I might work with it when I'm thinking about sculpture and sculptural practices. So um, I, just, I just know that that, um, that has always come up um, sort of since I started. Um, and another thing that I continue to be interested in, I always felt like theater was about crossing distance and crossing space. And I'll talk about this a little more as we get into um, the images, but I feel like that kind of connection is really important um, just to me all around. So uh, before I say anything else, actually, I, I really want to say thank you to the gallery and to Columbia Basin College for putting together the exhibit, um, for putting together this talk. And I also want to thank my home institution, Michigan Tech, for their support of my work. I have wonderful, supportive colleagues here, and it makes a tremendous difference in what one is able to make when that happens. Um, and I also need to acknowledge that in every project I'm going to show tonight, that there are many voices who have contributed to it, whether that's because they helped me directly or that their stories have made their way into the work somehow. So I thought I would actually start by chatting a little bit about this title, Arena. I'm a fan of layered meanings. You'll see that as we go through, um, whether that's in materials or in titles. And when I'm thinking about an arena, I'm thinking about a place where things happen, a place that's contained by some kind of boundary, political arena, sports arena, an arena stage, where the audience is on all sides of the performers. We could talk about geographic arena. And in Spanish, arena is sand. And I like these duplicate meanings. Grains of sand are something that it's just really hard to see just one of them. I think, you know, when you pick up a handful of sand, um, the grains are almost inseparable. And when you investigate sand dunes, I was just reading about recently, you learn that they're considered living organisms in a constant state of change and that there's so much change that lots of living things don't thrive there. Although some particular species can like drive down roots and really anchor in. So that to me, has become a really good metaphor for international relations and for connectivity. And my Zoom, my advance does not work. There we go. <laughs> so this image is an image I snapped of some notes on my studio wall at a residency a few years ago. And I wanna just actually give a shout out to the Santa Fe Art Institute for their tremendous support of artists. Um, anybody who gets a chance to go there should go. Um, I look at this image and I see notes that still matter to me years later, ideas and themes that keep coming up. So I'm seeing like tightrope and seesaw and bridge and gathering. So gathering. At the time, I was thinking about that as like gathering histories, but also like waves, how waves gather before they crash or gathering myself. Because when you make work about difficult topics, you sometimes have some internal gathering that you need to do. So pulling things together and gathering a story. And I wanna lay a little bit of context before we look at the work that's in your gallery right now. So in this image, here I am standing in the Iowa Prairie, 
I'm looking at it through a viewfinder. Um, at the time that I made this, which was about 10 years ago, I was making mostly work about ecology. And I was living in this landscape that felt really foreign to me. And I just thought that if I could look at its stories, maybe I could also find a place in it. So we have lots of feelings about the Midwest in this country. Some folks think of it as a flyover place. You hear that all the time, a place where nothing happens. A person often thinks about farming or in this case, industrial agriculture that comes up a lot. Um, it's the place historically that we crossed to get to the West Coast. But other folks are deeply connected to it. And some things that are resonant to me even today, years after this project, are things like the prairie is the most ecologically destroyed landscape in the United States. An intact prairie has the diversity of a rainforest. But much of what is valuable about it is underground. So you don't, you don't see it. For example, the roots of some of these plants, which go down three or four, sometimes even five meters below ground, stabilizing the soil. And in our historical move across the Midwest in our settlement of it, that's a point in US history where we have a ton of mythology. And it's a history that's fraught with conflict, but we have only just begun to scratch the surface of reconciling. So I was in this place with this tremendous ignored history, and I felt really lost there. So I started exploring what it felt like for me to be in this landscape. This here, what you're looking at, is the start of a piece called The Sleep Sack and Other Stories. The Sleep Sack is part backpack, part nest, part wayfinding gear. And I would work with it out in this landscape. And doing that was for me, working to come to terms with a landscape and my place in it, which is sometimes awkward and oftentimes lonely and unsure. And then four years ago, the rhetoric in this country about borders and walls got really frenzied. And I started to see this piece very differently as about a piece that was coming to terms with how we do or how we don't allow belonging in a place. What territory means, what displacement means or isolation. And at the same time I was working on the sleep sack, I was collaborating with a group called the Eva Luna Project, which was a group of incarcerated and non-incarcerated women named after the book, The Stories of Eva Luna, by Isabel Allende. And we wrote poems and did plays, we did readings, we made art installations, performed and held community talks. And the focus of that project was really about the importance of telling stories of silenced communities, in this case, women in prison, and on building connections between prison communities and the communities that surrounded them. So to get to the prison, I would drive across two hours of that Midwestern landscape where I was not feeling connected. Um, that was mostly destroyed prairie at the time. A lot of the time that drive was in winter. And I think this is how I started to wonder if how we treat our landscapes is a lot like how we treat each other. So incarcerated women actually have a lot in common with the prairie. They're often forgotten, hidden from view, there are moments of extraordinary beauty inside of prison and there's laughter and there's richness alongside all of the things you probably first think of when you think of prison. There are these other really beautiful things. So I found that work to be challenging and beautiful and hard and poetic in this sensitive place with a lot of stories that were hidden from view. And another thing I found really resonant was how clear it became how important our connections are with each other. So America's mythology has our westward expansion looking like this, some big adventure, mostly white, mostly male, when truthfully, it might look more like this, where the moves we make have consequences. And hoping on my part that what I'm about to do doesn't feel too much like whiplash, I'm gonna apply this line of thinking to US relationships in Latin America. 
and bring us into the arena. This image is a section from a memo called Covert Action Proposal Concerning Central America, dated September 9th, 1983. It's obviously redacted. And in addition to the missing content, which always interests me, and in this case, there's no way to know what it is, I am pretty interested in the action of these lines. When you look down the side of the page, the lines just kind of shove off to the sides there. And I think that quality of mark making to me has a certain kind of violence in blocking out the story. Here's another one where the names of the people who were to be eliminated, a euphemism used very often by the CIA, um, the names of the people who were used, who were to be eliminated during the Guatemala um, intervention by the US have been erased, it was completely blocked out. So going back to Evie Luna, and linking forward to this, I've always felt as though hidden stories may be our most valuable ones. And when something's buried, I wonder about it. When we're talking about this exhibit, we'll be talking mostly about the buried and hidden stories in the history between the US and Guatemala that have reverberations to this day. Secret eyes only. That phrase just catches me all the time, it catches me off guard. Here's an image I took in Guatemala in 2014. Mas poesia, menos policia. More poetry, less police. I look at this and I think it's an image about what art can be. Creating a space where poetry and freedom and life can flourish, where policing is less. Of course, it's also literal in this case. There's tremendous policing in Guatemala and lots of policing that the US does of Latin America overall. From the exhibit, I'll start with Not Mine. Not Mine is a series of bricks with the words Not Mine engraved on them. I have two parts to this story. The first part is years back during a really hard time, a psychologist recommended to me that when someone handed me something that I shouldn't be carrying, some kind of emotional baggage, that I could think of it like a brick and I could put it down, saying to myself, huh, thanks so much for that, but it's not mine. And then I made them. And in the funny way that art works, that was in 2017, when the talk of the wall between the US and Mexico was really fervent. And I stacked them up and this happened. Where there's a space, where both mine and not mine exist together. Which parts of this wall are mine? Which parts of this wall are not mine? Which parts of our history that looks like this or like this are mine? Asking those questions, the place I'm working from right now. Which brings us to the coordinates. The coordinates is a sculpture whose intention is to mark 26 of the 440 Mayan villages that were destroyed during a scorched earth policy during Guatemala's civil war. They're plaster casts of the space between your hands. If you cupped your hands together like you were trying to hold water, and you might be able to hold that water for a few seconds, but eventually it just runs through. The sculpture itself is made up of 26 units. Uh, I chose 26 because 440 was too many. And I chose 26 because 26 is two pairs of 13. And 13 is one Mayan number that marks the body. So I look at this piece as uh, what we say in Spanish is una pareja, a pair, partners, brother and sister, twins. And the full title of this work is Las coordenadas, the coordinates, or markers for 26 of the 440 Mayan villages destroyed during the Guatemalan anti-communist genocide funded in part by the United States between 1960 and 1996. I had a few folks help me make the casts. So I love in this work that the hands range in size. My assistant Hannah at the time, she has really tiny hands. So her casts look like child's hands and lots of children were lost in these massacres. 
my assistant Wyatt had kind of big hands. And so we get a, a range of sizes and we get a range of things that I feel like my hands can do or can represent. And then the coordinates of each village are inscribed across that impression, that space where the knuckles would be. As a side note, I think I've actually come to peace with them being plaster, which is a whole long conversation in terms of sculpture and materials. Um, for a while, I, I was really bothered by the plaster. I felt like I should look for a different material to redo this piece because plaster has this tremendous history in sculpture and I wasn't sure it was right but it does look a tiny bit like bone. And it does have some history that I do like. Uh, historically, plaster sometimes included animal hair or other bodily materials. It was a building material. We use it still to set bone. So maybe there's something with that, like a cast wrapped around the space of a memory. Also part of this piece are a series of texts that I usually hang on an opposing wall so that you can't view both of them in your frame of vision at the same time. The texts are taken from the really exceptional work done by Remy, the Commission of the Recovery of Historical Memory, which is a group that has gathered thousands of testimonies about Guatemala's civil war in an effort towards truth telling and reconciliation. And I do like to give a quick content warning before I pull up the readable ones. It'll just be two slides, but you can um, not look if you like. Um, the text is newsprint. It's taped and glued to the wall. The papers list uh, the coordinates of a village, the village's name, the ethnicity of the people who lived there, the number of victims, and an account of the massacre. And one of the most touching things I have ever seen with this piece, just gets me um, anytime I think of it, um, was walking into the gallery where it was installed and seeing a viewer walk back and forth and back and forth between the casts and the texts, trying to read the story, trying to match them together. At this point, I thought I would show a few artists whose work really inspires me. This image you're looking at is an installation view of Doris Salcedo's really beautiful, really hard work, Unland. Unland is made up of a series of tables. They've been broken apart and then put back together and then stitched with human hair. She is one of my art heroes. Um, and she developed this work after interviewing children in Colombia who had seen the murders of their parents. This next one is called Unland Irreversible Witness. And I saw an interview with Dora Salcedo once where she said something that has always stayed with me. She said, I was born in the wrong place and from the wrong place I work. This title Unland is a word she invented to suggest displacement. Um, she was inspired actually by the poet Paul Salon who was known for his writings in the aftermath of the Holocaust, saying that language seemed insufficient at the time to address such traumatic events and that language needed to be reinvented. Jumana Abud has also always been an inspiration. She works with memory and loss and resilience. Um, in particular, she tells stories of occupied Palestine um, and she works with personal and cultural mythologies. This drawing of hers is called Spirit of the Almond Spring. And I look at it and I just see so many things happening and so much longing. And I also look to Alison Welch, whose series Meet Alison, an American Girl, to me is particularly striking and representative also of something I am trying to work through. So in this series, uh, the artist recreates herself as an American Girl doll from the child series and the dolls and the books. And what's really striking to me is actually how she speaks about how she learned history through the books and the dolls as a child and how the history that she learned there was extremely whitewashed. And of course now, when we explore our history and we look at it and we actually dig down, you find lots of other things. And in her images, really, I feel like she works on those complications. The history that's been crafted to be beautiful, almost mythological, 
appropriate for children, and the missing pieces that don't quite fit, some anachronisms that disrupt the view. Getting back over here to the gallery, thinking about histories and complications, this is transando. Trenzar in Spanish, to braid. Transando, braiding. Transando is a floor sculpture. Uh, I chose to put it down quite low because I felt that it was important that when you looked at this piece, you would tower over it or you would change your body to get close to it. You would crouch down. Um, it's made up of traditional Mayan textiles, the elos, the threads used to make weavings. And they're braided and then balanced on these wooden supports. And there are 20 units organized as a grid. 20 is another number that Mayan peoples use to refer to the body. And within the sculpture, there are US dollars and Guatemalan quetzales woven into the braids. In Spanish, when things connect, we say they are entrelazados, intertwined, woven, braided. And it's hard, I think, for many people, anyone, certainly me, to see braids and not think of human hair. So the sculpture has become, for me, a memorial marking missing and disappeared persons and a conversation about our braided histories. In this detail, you can see the quetzales and the dollars woven into the braids. And in the case of Guatemala, something I'm just trying to point towards here is that there was a tremendous economic interest in the United States that led to the tremendous acts of violence that we supported that then led directly to genocide. At the same time I was making Transando, I was working as part of a poetry festival in Aguacatan, Guatemala. And that year, the festival was dedicated to immigrants. So much of its poetry was written with migration in mind. Roberta Mascaro's poem, asking how many people we've lost and what they might have been was on my mind at the same time I was working on this next piece, which became all the poets I have ever, we could have ever loved. I was thinking about the cost of violence and the cost of war in human life, but we can also talk about the cost of life in border crossings and in both cases, the loss of children or the indoctrination of children into violence. This piece is made up of trompos. They are traditional wooden toys. They work like spinning tops. And it was pointed out to me by someone in the gallery once that they resemble just a little bit grenades, especially when they're lined up in formation like this. They are dipped in spices. There's cinnamon and achiote, and they're arranged on banana paper. And the sculpture, another one that's pretty low to the ground, um, the smell just kind of wafts up and enters your body. This is another work made with the same material, um, those wooden trompos, but the wood here is just left alone. And they've been engraved with a line from my partner Hugo Gordillo's poem, Game of Chance, Juego de Azar. In that poem, uh, Hugo talks about police and military corruption. And the line that you're seeing engraved here says, when we were children, we played cops and robbers. So then I worried about make, I wondered, I wondered about making those texts larger. And here's a portion of that same line. The children played one of the canvases in the gallery. Um, my partner is a former journalist. And I think a lot when I work with him about the power of words written simply. One time, when we were chatting, uh, when Hugo was in Guatemala, uh, it was on the day that uh, their former dictator Rios Montt was convicted of war crimes, which was really unusual and really unexpected in Guatemala that that conviction would actually happen. And that day uh, when the conviction came down, Hugo sent me a message and he said, I received this package in the mail of my books all torn apart. And so did a lot of my writer friends. And he said, that tells me they want us to know they're still watching us. So this next canvas is taken from one of Hugo's poems. Um, this phrase here, the persecution was so violent, even the hummingbirds fell silent. 
has always really stayed in my mind. So I'm thinking about distance and distances crossed and spaces in our history. And this image by the artist A.K. Dolvin has become really meaningful for me as that happens. The sculpture is called Out of Tune. Uh, Dolvin made this in 2011. It's installed in Folkestone in the UK. And it's a 14th century Anglican bell, church bell, that the artist describes as a bell that is rejected for not being in tune with the others, or a rescue of an untuned bell from being melted for scrap bronze. It's a sound installation. People can ring the bell. And I imagine when that sound happens, there's just this sound calling out across this space that you can probably feel in your body. And I look at the image and I also respond to the massive distance between these columns and the space that is just really part of this piece. The tension of the cable that holds the bell in balance, a sense of connectivity and loneliness. And it makes me wonder about the quality of connection and if it's a stretch to say Latin America is perceived to be out of sync with the US desires that have shaped the stories we tell, the distances we cross in some really hard ways. But there's this little bit of joy in this image that comes down to this one person walking across in a pink coat. And to me, there is just a little bit like in this poem by Rudy Alfonso Gomez Rivas, a Guatemalan poet, where he says, I resist the gloomy reality, the misleading mirrors, and above all, I still believe in cherry trees. The last piece I'm gonna talk about is called Tightrope Practice or US Latin American Relations. It happened as an accident. This is important. Um, I was installing a show and there was this scrap piece of plywood lying around getting in our way all the time. And I tossed it on the floor. And when it landed, I thought, well, crap, that's the best work of art I've ever made. International relations can be a lot like a tightrope. US Latin American relations certainly are. Some things are delicate, some things are easy. Some things appear to be easy and they are actually delicate. And it should be simple to walk across this because it is just a small piece of wood sitting on the floor. And yet, and I think about how when calls for walls or borders or sanctions or violence come, they often come as if it was simple without looking at the tremendous economic and social and political history of our own actions in this country and in those places and the tremendous role those actions have played. And I wonder about moving our history from this and what we do and we don't talk about and this and this more towards this and what role art might play in all of that. Thank you very much. I think there's time for questions aloud. Yes, there is. So if you have a question, feel free to type it in the Q&A feature or else in the chat, and I will read them out loud so it will be on the recording, and then Lisa can go ahead and respond. So Juventino asks, um, how do you determine or arrive at sharing someone else's lived experiences that are not your own, i.e. the US-Mexico border and the people of Central America? That is such a tremendous and perfect question. Thank you for that. Um, my answer to that is that I, I work to tell stories that, that have found me. Um, and I try to be really sensitive about how I'm doing that. Um, so in this case, for me personally, um, I didn't have this on my radar. And then I was at an artist in residence program um, where I met my partner 
um, and we became, we started talking and, um, and he said, we should collaborate. Um, I think you need to see my country. I think there are some stories you need to know. And, um, and so I sort of dipped my toes in that water um, and realized um, that this was some pretty valuable history that is not taught in our country. Um, and you have to, I mean, it's pretty easy to find it if you know to look for it, um, but it's not part of our canon in any way in any of the like public school system, for example. And that to me is problematic. So what I, what I look at in these particular stories is that some of the story is mine um, because I have a responsibility to, to share this as someone who is from this culture that did a lot of damage um, and to try to find ways to, to reconcile what that, what that is or what that might look like. And I try to do it very carefully. Um, I think you really do need to do that. So like lots of consultation with um, Guatemalan collaborators, um, try to be super respectful. Um, I think, you know, sometimes we're more successful at that than others. Um, and it's always on my mind um, if, you know, what parts of this story um, should I touch? What parts of the story should I not? And actually, um, about maybe three months ago, I had I had put away one of these sculptures, the coordinate sculpture where the, with the hands, I hadn't looked at it in a while. And I took it out to do some work on it. And I had been at this place where I thought, I'm going to stop with this. I'm going to do something else. And I took the texts out and I ended up like just leafing through them all again. And I, I said to myself, no, <laughs> this is really important. Um, and it's not actively shared. Um, and so, so I have to keep going because until we, like, I feel like we, so much of the States is like, we're gonna build a wall. Um, we're not gonna talk about the fact that, you know, we overthrew the governments of seven, eight countries and caused tremendous economic and ecological damage, but we're gonna build a wall. I feel like we need to have that conversation. And one of my contributions can be um, making some objects that are starting points for a conversation. And um, I just try to do that the best I can. Thank you for that question. That's a really great question. I have a quick question. <laughs> and this is kind of a, you know, a technical sort of question, but can you talk to our students a little bit about maybe how your work fits into sculpture as an expanding field? Like maybe a little bit of historical background on how yeah. your objects fit? I would love to. Um, yeah, so I, um, you know, I mentioned that I, I started in theater and so, when I went to graduate school and I became a sculptor, um, I had a little adjusting to do in terms of materials and meaning. Um, and I just wanna say that first because I still, I still design for theater, I still paint for theater. And in theater, we use whatever material we need to use and we manipulate it however we want to um, just so that it looks right at the end. And in sculpture, there's a lot of thinking about what a material might mean. Not everybody does that, but like, the way I was trained and the sculptures I really respond to and most of the sculptors I interact with now, um, you know, it's like, is it metal or wood? What kind of wood? Where was it farmed? What, you know, what is the story there? All of those things kind of play into to things. And so like thinking about how materials um, can be resonant in our bodies and also um, how they have meaning is like a fundamental part of my practice. Um, I am still mostly an object maker. Um, sculpture, I feel like I, I try to be expanded, right? And I, I mean, I think of like using materials in different ways and um, telling like stories and connecting with community. Um, so maybe I'm not, you know, I'm not a traditional object maker and like, this is something we're just gonna like 
put outside and let sit. Um, but I'm still making things that you could touch most of the time. I mean, I have, we have an audio installation in the gallery and those things, but um, so I'm not quite that expanded, you know? <laughs> although I would really like to be. Um, but I think like traditionally, I mean, I guess I sort of fall, um, I fall in the camp of um, wanting to create things that your body can experience um, or spaces that you can respond to um, because I think that's something that sculpture can do. It's not that other fields cannot do it, but it, it may be a little harder for a painting to do that um, consistently or in certain ways, you know, like an object on the wall versus an object that I need to move around. Um, those are different things. Um, and I'm just, I'm just always thinking when I'm working, um, what is the story and what are the most appropriate materials I can find to tell it and how I can get that story to be, I guess, like absorbed into someone's body as they're experiencing it as a sculpture. So the next question maybe kind of goes into that a little bit about what you just said, but they ask, um, it's anonymous, um, why sculpture in particular? Why sculpture, wow. So I, wow, um, <laughs> why sculpture? Um, it is, it does go with what I just said, but I'll tell, I'll back it up and tell you a story. Um, when I applied to grad school, I applied to the sculpture program and the painting program. Um, and the painting program did not accept me. And I was heartbroken. I spent an entire day in bed. Um, because in the theater, I was a painter. That's my identity. But um, I was in the sculpture program for about three, four months. And I was like, oh, I get it. I see why I'm a sculptor. Because even in my painting class, I was like, well, how about if I like break a hole through this wall to do the painting? Or maybe the painting can surround the person's body. Or maybe it's on the ceiling. Or like, I was just really inclined to think about space. Um, and I'm sure that is related to like my earlier life where like, I mean, how you walk through a space on stage is a really big deal and how you can reach an audience. But, um, but it also is just like something kind of resonant in my heart, like wanting, um, wanting to feel an object um, and liking to handle things also. So that um, even though I do find, and I tell this of my own, to my own students all the time, I do find sculpture like the most fascinating and the most frustrating field that I can imagine because you can never be an expert if you're gonna work with 20 different materials and then change them the next week and then change them the next year, you are just constantly learning, which is amazing and does not really allow mastery in a way that I personally would like, right? Um, there are sculptors who do like totally master their materials. Um, Martin Perrier is a, another hero of mine. And I feel like, I mean, the work that he creates is amazing. But, um, but when you're always changing your position and responding to the material in the story, you're like, okay, now I'm learning. Now I'm learning to weave. Now I'm learning to work with salt. Today, I would like to work with cotton candy. Now I'm working with wood. Like there's just so much to learn um, that it can be kind of extraordinary, but also um, really challenging. Um, but I like I appreciate that. I think um, it is like nice to not be bored. <laughs> so. so the next question is from William. He asks, do you ever worry that your work won't be understood the way you want it to if someone is viewing it without knowing the context in which it was created? Do I worry about that? Hmm. I don't actually worry about that. I think it's entirely possible and it's a completely legitimate question. And it is, it happens all the time that my work is not um, necessarily known in, without its context, right? Um, but I don't know that I like, that I worry about it. I can help that process by providing some context if people want to read it, right? So like, um, you know, there might be a little interpretive text. Um, the title of the coordinates is intentionally very long. Um, because it gives the context of that piece as a memorial, right? It's like, we paid for this genocide. Um, that's in the title, right? Funded by the United States. So that's a kind of a way to do that. But ultimately, I also believe that objects should be able to speak for themselves. And I've been doing this reading, you know, different artists are talking about like, 
you know, maybe the artist isn't the person to comment on the work. Um, you know, we've, we've made it, we're close to it, and then it goes into the world. And so, um, so like, you know, this slide I have up right now, like, you know, it's just a piece of wood on the floor and you might walk across it and have a great time and like fall off. And like, I've seen people play with them and like, you know, have fun with their friends. Um, and other people who, you know, understand the context or come to the context and have a different experience or the same, cause like we can be playful in this space as well. Um, so I think, I mean, like I'm open to a range of interpretations. I try to give enough cues that if you were looking for what the rest of the story was, you could find it. Um, the next question is from another anonymous attendee. Um, and they say, I am somewhat familiar with your work and I find myself constantly challenged by your work and its themes. With the intensity and emotion involved in your pieces, can I ask how you cope or perhaps how you decompress and rejuvenate to allow you to continue? Wow. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, thank you. There's someone out there who's a little familiar with my work. That's so nice. Um, well, uh, I'll start with this story. A um, couple years ago, a couple years ago, is that really true? 2015. So yeah, a couple years ago. Um, I was trying to make a drawing um, about missing persons um, in, in Guatemala. There's um, hundreds of thousands of people who were disappeared or displaced. And what I was doing was I was like holding a stone to the wall and tracing it and trying to do another one. And at the time I was doing, it was an active performance. There was a show in the gallery and the audio installation that we have in this exhibition was playing. So I was listening to this installation, the audio for hours at a time. And at one point I was like, I, I have to stop. Like I, I, I cannot be in this space anymore. Um, and um, anyway, so like I, I slowed down, I did less hours, I took more breaks. Um, so like recognizing that is important. Um, I think that another answer to this is um, these are really hard stories and I didn't have to live through them. So, um, so I need to find a way to keep going um, because they were harder for other people, you know? Um, but I do also like, I, you know, I do a lot of yoga. Um, I'm part of a great running group, got amazing female friends that support me. Um, I try to alternate in what I'm making. Like I make some pieces like this and then like I make something with flowers and, um, and, you know, try to, you know, because my personality is such that I'm like wanting the uplifting thing, but also I have in me the, um, the thing that wants to dig down and wants to look for what's been hidden. And those are still in conflict within me. They are not, um, they haven't found a synergy. So I, I kind of swing back and forth, but I do think it's really important. Um, I try to honor it in myself, like to give yourself breaks and to like, try to really take good care of yourself as an artist. If you want to keep working, you certainly need to do that. Um, like I said, I try to honor that. I, I hope that I do. Um, but sometimes, you know, you do just get tired and, um, and just take like a longer, a longer period away or do something else that's like completely refreshing, um, play with your dog. <laughs> that kind of thing. That was a great question. Thank you. Gives, you know, I think about that all the time. Lynn asks, um, what do you do? Oh, sorry. What do you do when you're drawn to a blank and can't figure out how to make something out of nothing? Oof. I don't have a lot of blanks. What I have is a need to live about five lifetimes to manage all the things I'd like to do. <laughs> but but there are tremendous hiccups in my studio process. I'm in my studio right now and like out of the camera's frame, I see all these partially finished things that really need to get done. And some of them, like, it's not the blank, like it's not a, like an idea. It's just like, how do I move this forward? I need the skill or I need like, I don't know, another 10 years to work out how I feel about this thing. Um, what do I do? I work on something else. Um, I take a walk. 
Um, sometimes I just bash my head in the wall. Like, like it's part of my process, right? Like um, I'm going to try to keep trying and keep trying and keep trying. And that doesn't actually work. Um, what works for me. And I think like what I try to tell my students too, is like, give yourself a little space because if you can't solve the problem when you're standing there in front of it and you're just like frustrated and tired and you keep trying, you may actually solve the problem. Like when you get coffee with a friend and you're not thinking about it, it's just like your brain has had time to step away and process. And so I, I like, I try to give myself those spaces. Um, trying to think if I was ever like, I'm sure there's a time where I was really, really stuck. Like at the very start of a project, maybe like where do, where is our way into this? What is, what are we like? What am I really going to do? Um, that might be like really helped by research, um, like doing a lot of reading. I mean, I put up some you know some poems by poets that I was inspired by. You know, mostly Guatemalan poets, not all. Um, reading some of the historical context, just like playing with materials and seeing what sticks. Like all of those things, I think can help. So Camille asks first, um, how long did this project take you? And um, do you often find yourself starting pieces and not finishing them? Yes, this project, wow. Well, I started making this work in 2013 and I think it's gonna, if I let it, it would be, it could be the only thing I did for the rest of my life. Um, I will make other things um, because I need to do that for myself. But I think that um, there is so much here and it is still a pretty quiet story to most people that I should keep going. Um, the pieces that you're looking at here, I mean, the one that's up right now, like that, you know, that took five minutes. That was like, oh, we threw that on the floor and we're gonna keep that because that was an accident that was very happy. Um, and I love, I actually love this work. I think that, I think that little bit of plywood, there's just something there that's totally magical. Um, the trenses and transando braiding, um, there was a lot of thought about what this might be. Um, I was visiting a Guatemalan weaver. We were talking about his process. Um, I took a tour. We looked at like, how weaving can basically be like message keeping. Um, I was really fascinated by that. Um, and then somewhere in there, I thought I'm gonna work with these braids. Um, so that, you know, that probably, that probably took a year. Although building that, you know, maybe was like a two week process, right? Of like, we gotta cut the wood and add the braces on the back and then organize the trenches. And that doesn't actually take that long. There was just a lot of research, um, research getting there. I feel like I'm missing the second part of that question, Rebecca. Did I answer that? Um, the second half was, do you often find yourself starting pieces and not finishing them? <sighs> wow. <laughs> do we all? <laughs> so I, I The look was, I was like looking on my studio wall of like, I've got like, you know, 20 ideas up and, but I'm working on this other thing, right? And I do really wanna come back to like, I've got this, um, this idea for making like onesies that wrap around abandoned oil rigs. And, um, and I really wanna do that. But that idea came like probably about a year ago. And then um, these other projects, like I let them insert themselves or they inserted themselves, right? And so I have sketches on the wall of those onesies for Orphan Wells, but you know, they've been started. Um, I do hope to finish them. Um, I think we all, I think we all suffer from that as artists. I think um, there's just so much great material in the world to like respond to and make art about and just to live that like you start something and then it's like squirrel over there. I've got to like find another thing. And, um, and then, you know, something takes your attention. Um, I try to circle back like when something really matters, but sometimes I think if you leave something, maybe you should have, you know, like maybe um, like some projects that I started that didn't go all the way through. Um, it just, you know, it wasn't the right time. It wasn't like their destiny to be in the world at this point. And maybe I wasn't the person to make them. I was the person to make this other thing.
And do we have any more questions? I didn't see any pop up in the chat. Oh, here we go. Here's that one from um, another anonymous attendee. It's a lived experience rebuttal. Um, in fairness, the works that tell a story not of your own or are done collaboratively should receive credit. It feels slightly exploitative when these experiences are not your own. I think that's totally fair. Um, I do, I do give credit. Um, for example, um, the audio work, which we didn't show in this talk, um, when you see it come up, the credits are always there um, because that work is directly in collaboration. Um, it's a response, uh, it's a translation actually of a poem written by my main collaborator, my husband, um, and you know, put to um, specific musical notes with audio engineers um, and a bassist. Those people absolutely must be credited. Um, in Transando, um, I bought the Elos from someone in the same way that I bought the sheet of plywood. Um, I totally agree with you that um, there are collaborators in that story, right? Um, but I don't know who to name there. I mean, other than acknowledging what the history is um, and saying like, this is a story that I am working to care for and working to tell. And I fully, like fully understand like this is something, I mean, this is a really hot topic. So, um, so like, thank you for that. And, um, and I hear it and I do really try to be aware of it. Um, and I, I mean, I think we just all try to do the best that we can. Another anonymous attendee asks, did you ever worry that this career path wouldn't be fulfilling financially and or you wouldn't gain an audience? <sighs> oh yeah, <laughs> I worry that still. Um, I am a tenured faculty member at an institution and you know it's still not always easy to support oneself. Um, you know, actually I'm thinking of an artist that um, came to visit us here and they talked about something that I thought was so great. They said, you know, like sometimes, like if someone's a banker, they say, I'm a banker, and you know that's how they make their money. It's like, that's their career. When someone's an artist, they might make their money as an artist, or they might be a banker, you know, like they might do something else. Um, and, you know, people just, there's like no, we don't talk about enough like how people make financial things work for them um, in alternative career paths. There are so many ways to do that. Um, there are, you know, having several different jobs, which is not really rejuvenating to yourself all the time or your art, right? Um, there's like having a job that allows you some space to make art or, um, marrying well, I don't know, like, I mean, there's like all these things you can do. Um, that's a terrible thing to say. But, um, but I, I feel like, um, I mean, I did some other things. Um, you know, I, I worked in theater, which, you know, people say that's like, not a good career path, but it's a huge industry. Um, I had my own business for a while. Um, I taught high school, I teach college. I mean, I do things that help me make this possible. Um, but like, ultimately I think, yeah, I think I'm just, I'm gonna call myself an artist, whether I make money from the act of making art or not, because being the artist is like part of just who I am. Um, but I'm very aware, I mean, it's, it's, you know, there, I have, I have friends who have more resources, right? And they can do things that I can't do. Um, I am the sole earner in my family and, um, and a faculty income split between two people is, is a little harder than one, you know, where two people are earning. Um, these are like conversations that I think people should have more openly, like, you know, like what does economic sustainability look like and how do you make things work? Um, and I consider it more, I mean, you know, I'm 46, so I probably consider it more now than I did 10 years ago. Um, I do think it's maybe responsible of us to our future selves 
to keep it in mind. Um, and I don't have a good answer for what that looks like for anybody else but me, but like, I'm very lucky because I do have this job that allows me to like talk about art all day with students and then make art um, also. And the job is interested in me doing that. Um, not all jobs are like that, um, but some jobs can give you space to still, um, you know, Chekhov was a doctor um, and he said, um, I love this. Um, medicine is my wife and writing is my mistress. <laughs> and, um, so he did something else, right? Um, but we know him as Chekhov. We don't actually know him as, you know, Dr. Chekhov who cared for his patients, right? We know him as the great um, Russian writer. So people make things work in different ways. Um, we got a question that was maybe more for our, our CBC folks. Um, she asks, or, um, I was wondering if as a Running Start student, you can join things like band and if there's a theater production um, as well. And, you know, the short answer to that is yes. <laughs> um, we do have a music program and a theater program, and of course, our, our visual arts classes that you can sign up for. Uh, and you can email me personally, um, and I can hopefully direct you to some um, resources. And my email is just galleriedirector at columbiabasin.edu. Thank you. And um, do we have um, any other questions for Lisa? Okay, we are just about at 5.30, so this would probably be a good time to wrap up, if not. And so once again, I'd like to thank Lisa so much for your time and for um, talking to us about your work, as well as, you know, participating in our virtual exhibition. Um, and I'd like to thank all of our attendees for your participation, and we will see you next time. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Lisa. Thank you. Yeah, this was, was wonderful. Great. Thank you. Yeah. My cat liked it too. I don't know if you <laughs> <laughs> that there were such great questions. Like I I was really floored by the questions. So it was really wonderful. Yeah. Good.